Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is on 10 things that will kill your IoT application and how to fix them quickly. My name is Jeremy Cowan. I'm Editorial Director uh, and Founder of IoT Now, speaking to you from here in the UK, and it's a real pleasure for me to be your moderator today. Thank you all for joining us wherever you are around the world. We've got a really vital discussion today for anyone who's ever faced a problem with their own IoT application. And we are delighted to bring this to you thanks to our partners at ARIS. So the first thing to do is welcome our speaker in Santa Clara, California. He is Stephen Glapper, and Stephen is Vice President of Product Management at ARIS. Good to have you here, Stephen. Thank you, Jeremy. Happy to be here. If you have any hands-on experience in IoT, I guess you'll already know that things can and do go wrong with connected applications. If your business is built on a connected product or service and your remote devices aren't transmitting data as you intended, then Every minute that a problem goes unfixed, it costs you money and it costs you customer satisfaction. And Stephen is going to help us to fix this today. But first, there's a couple of things I need to say. Let me tell you first that this webinar is being recorded. And as always, from tomorrow, you can stream this webinar from our website, which is at iot-now.com. We always want to know what you think, and so, with no exceptions, this webinar will also be bringing you to live polls, and they're coming up. They are totally anonymous, so you can say exactly what you think, and during the webinar, you can send us more questions too. Send them to me at any time, starting right now, and I'll put as many as I can to Stephen at the end. All you have to do is click on the questions icon, type yours into the window, and any that we don't cover today, we will do our best to answer offline. Finally, if you're having any technical issues with the audio or video or slides, you can also use the questions button to get advice from our tech support team. We'll have our opening poll in a minute, but first I want to hand over to Stephen. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, thanks to all of you who've joined us today. We hope to make this an informative and helpful hour for you by sharing some key lessons we've learned from our couple of decades of experience in, in IoT. I should note, to save you some typing or screenshotting, uh, if that's your thing, uh, that we'll make these slides and their speaker's notes available after the webinar. Uh, and we'll send that around uh, with the link to the live, to the recording. So to get started, I thought it would be useful to expand a little bit on what we mean by experience by giving you a more concrete sense of the fact base that we're working with here. For starters, our two decades of connecting millions of devices all over the world have given us a massive sample size of operational exposure, both as a connectivity provider and as a full IoT stack provider in million unit scale connected vehicle programs. This massive sample has allowed our team in preparation for this conversation uh, to plow through thousands of call center tickets and hundreds of ops team escalation reports to build a detailed and quantified profile of what goes wrong in real world IoT networks and how those issues can be best detected, resolved, and prevented. Beyond massive scale, particularly in connected vehicles, our sample also includes intense operation across the full range of both fixed and mobile IoT applications that use cellular uh, connectivity from remote healthcare to fleet management, asset tracking, personal emergency response, utilities monitoring, energy production, and a bunch more. But enough about us. Uh, let's take a moment for our first poll question so we can learn a little about you all. So back to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Stephen. The first question is this. Where are you on your IoT journey? Are you just learning about the industry? Are you in the early stages of a new connected product or service program? Are you recently launching a new connected 
thing? Or do you have experience with connected things at large scale? So the answers are starting to come in. I'll just run through that quickly again. Where are you on your IoT journey? Learning about the industry, or number two, in the early stages of a new service or a program. Thirdly, have you recently launched a new connected thing? Or lastly, have you experience with connected things at large scale? And whilst those answers are still continuing to come in, there's a fairly even spread between learning about the industry or being in the early stages with a slight uh, lead taken by those who already have experience and at large scale. Um, I don't know about you, Stephen, I wasn't quite expecting to see that nosing into the front, but it's good to see, I think, that it, that it is. Uh, was that your expectation? Uh, I was expecting kind of an even balance, which is, a, which is about what we've got. Uh, it's nice that, you know, the IoT industry is, is not mature exactly because there's still lots and lots of exciting stuff going on. Uh, but it's been around a while. So, and we have customers that have been with us for uh, the better part of the 20 years. So, uh, and, and one of the comments that I've, I've heard in response to this uh, material, which we've, we've uh, shared with others, um, is that even if you are, you know, part of a, uh, an experienced team, there's always stuff you can learn from other people's experience. So uh, that's, what we, that's what we hope to share more of today. That is very I think we can, uh, we, we can move on from there uh, as, the, as the answers trickle in. Um, and uh, so um, I want to get into, um, hang on just one second here. I got to get back to my, uh, I got to get back to my, my platform. There we go. Um, I want to get into the way in which we've organized the material here uh, and, and talk about really the three key lessons that we've learned uh, over our, our own IoT journey over the past 20 years. Number one, um, uh, there's a wide variety of things that can go wrong at potentially very large scale, putting performance, cost, and control at risk for your connected things, and in the worst case, for your whole business. Uh, and, and this is actually a fact that's happened to people. Uh, number two, as the well-known saying goes, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. But when prevention fails, you need rapid detection, root cause isolation, and resolution. And number three, and this may sound a little odd, but to make that resolution possible, you need to find a way to get some brains back into the situation, which is a concept I'll explain in a bit. To illustrate the scale part of number one, I want to show you a real world example in the form of an issue one of our larger customers ran into last fall. So what you're looking at here is a two week snapshot of the total data sessions per hour for their half million devices. And it shows the common business application pattern of peaks during each weekday and smaller volumes on the weekends. At first glance, week two on the left looks a lot like week, I'm sorry, week two on the right looks a lot like week one on the, on the left. But if you look closer at Tuesday in week two, what you'll find is that the metric of total data usage by their devices started rising rapidly around 1030 in the morning for no apparent reason to a large multiple of their typical rate. Something had gone very wrong with this customer's usage per session, as you can see here. Given their large device count, this drove multiple, literally multiple millions of dollars in connectivity cost overages over the next few days, and understandably no small amount of panic on the part of their team, while root cause investigation continued to figure out what was, the, what was causing all this, right? So to emphasize the point, potentially large scale issues with possibly terminal impact on your business are a real thing in IoT applications. To enable the illustration of the wide variety of issues part of our lesson number one, first we need to talk about cellular for a minute. We tend to assume as users and app developers that cellular just works and so do our apps. This is nearly always true, fortunately, for smartphones and end user apps because, and, and, the, and the real reason there is because their behavior is under very tight control by mobile operators and the app store providers in a lot of activity around testing and certification that happens behind the scenes. As a result, understanding how things really work under the hood of cellular and apps at the edge or in a cloud isn't really necessary for us. However, figuring out how to fix an IoT solution when it's broken is a whole other matter. It really does require a deep understanding of how things work 
across the full end-to-end -end of the IoT solution. Especially for cellular IoT, you really do have to get your head around a fairly complex technology chain from the thing on one end through the mobile networks and up into your cloud and its support for end user applications. Fortunately, for our purposes today, we don't really need to wade through all this 3D, 3G PP detail. We can use instead a simplified view with some unpacking in just a couple of specific spots. The details generally boil down to four segments. Your connected things, the radio access networks or bands with which they communicate, the mobile core that controls that communication, and your application cloud. The first spot where IoT specific detail is required is at the edge where, as we'll see in a minute, the majority of problems get their start. In contrast to the tightly controlled smartphone scene that I talked about, IoT devices and applications typically involve a lot more moving parts including potentially seven or more layers of software from different sources, from the SIMS firmware up through the radio module, the device, and local user interfaces. All of those are being revised on their own independent cycles, plus multiple active physical devices like sensors and cameras and multiple local networks connecting all this. This is a good application of a favorite dry British phrase, what could possibly go wrong? And the answer is, lots. I know we advertised 10, so my apologies for overshooting that. But as we dug into our own experience sample, plus some noteworthy hacking news from the industry, we found many more than 10 different classes of real world examples of things that can take down IoT solutions across the full range of elements from end to end. The device element, as we illustrated, is fertile ground for software bugs, misconfiguration, hardware failures, connectivity inefficient software logic, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, when we get to prevention, and rarely, fortunately, theft or hacking. Radio access networks have local outages, tower-specific coverage and capacity issues, and unannounced configuration changes by regional teams in the MNOs, with which IoT devices have difficulty coping with on their own. In the core and cloud, Devices gone awry at scale can outrun capacity planning and create outages there too. And in your cloud, misconfiguration or software bugs can create app level outages, either whole or in part, and they can drive large scale issues at the device end by providing improper, improper responses as well. Now, we'd like to get your reaction to this list. So it's time for our next poll question. Back to you, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Um, Stephen, the question that uh, we wanted to put to the audience is this. Do these killers of IoT sound familiar? Um, the ones that, that Stephen's already outlined, uh, is that no, wow, I had no idea all of this can go wrong. Or number two, I've seen some of these, but I guess there may be new surprises for us ahead. That's pretty fair. Totally, I've seen this all before is answer number three. Or answer four, yes, been there, seen that, but you did miss a couple. And if so, if your answer is number four, please, please share them with us in the chat. So we're getting a, a strong uh, lead coming through, but quickly, do these killers sound familiar? No, or yes, I've seen some of these, or totally, I've seen all of this before, or there are others, and here I can share them with you. Stephen, what's your thinking on this? Is a really strong preponderance here of I've seen some of these, but there's clearly more to learn. Uh, well, that actually sort of reconciles with our experience as well, because we fortunately we haven't had any of our customers who've had everything happen to them. It's usually one one issue, and and in fact, you know, you know the majority of our customers don't see these things much at all. Uh, but uh, but things happen, and so. Again, not, not much of a surprise that uh, uh, no, one's, no one's seen them all. No. So it looks like we've kind of settled on that. So let's um, go back. Let's proceed on. All right. Let's go back. Over to you. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's head on to the, um, uh, to the perspectives we've, we've gained from having kind of compiled that list. And the other aspect of that uh, that I wanted to highlight before we kind of get into uh, the rest of the story here uh, is that um, – you know, based on our troll through our experience base, which I was talking about a little bit anecdotally there, 
Um, and so remember those couple hundred ops team escalation reports that I mentioned? Uh, that was a long weekend of reading in order to get to uh, a pretty good sense of relative frequency and scale of impact. And, and those things you know, have to be considered together um, across the four essential elements plus transport of the end to end. With the device and cloud elements uh, in combination being responsible for the greatest amount of, of issues and the impact. Uh, and it's in large part because if you have a large number of devices and a little thing goes wrong, it becomes a big thing just because of the scale. Uh, so this finding actually has some fairly significant implications for the tools you need to have at hand when you're addressing our lesson number two, uh, which, as you'll recall, was prevention and rapid response to issues. We'll start with response, which is usually the most urgent matter. Um, and uh, we'll talk about what we found uh, that is kind of unique about troubleshooting and fixing IoT solutions across the end. There are some unique challenges, and, and I'd like to illustrate why by starting with an experience that we're all familiar with, which is what we do when our internet stops working, which I hope none of you experience right now so we can finish this. But you know how this works, right? So your internet stops responding. So first you check to make sure your laptop Wi-Fi is connected to your access point. Uh, and then you cycle the power on the access point to see if that's gotten wedged for some reason. Um, and then if that's not solving the problem, you power cycle your cable modem or your DSL box, whatever, whatever you've got, uh, to make sure it's working from fresh code boot. And when that fails, you call a neighbor you know, who you know has the same service to see if it's just you or if they're down too, and, and that may help, be helpful or not, but if he's still going, then, uh, then you call your cable company or your, or your telco. And that, as usual, is kind of a big waste of time because the person on, at the call center can't actually fix anything. Um, they can just tell you, hey, it looks good from our end. So ultimately, in that case, you get reconnected by tethering your laptop to your smartphone mobile personal hotspot, and you're good to go back to work. In an IoT context, there's something you have to keep in mind that's very, very important to notice about this. Uh, we got back online in this story because there's an instance of this incredible thing called the human brain on site, yours. That can apply intelligence, flexibility, and creative problem-solving issues uh, abilities to the issue, right? IoT is different. There are no brains on site. The propane tank, for example, is phoning home to report and gets no answer or an indecipherable answer from the cloud, the tank's you know, logically rigid software will just wait for a configured amount of time and then try again, and again, and again, and again, and again. You get the idea. A, a programmatic endless loop that is easy to see can cause substantial problems, especially if there are hundreds of thousands of propane tanks with the same issue. The question we want to explore here is, how do we insert some brains back into our IoT network picture? The answer is a thing called the mobile core. Skipping a lot of implementation detail, uh, functionally, the core is involved in everything the network does to support cellular connectivity, controlling who gets on the network, to do what, and how much, at what cost, and build how. Because of its controlling role, uh, the core necessarily provides remote visibility into all device interactions with the RAN and traffic details from the device all the way up to the cloud, which can be essential to rapid troubleshooting at individual device and device pool levels. Further, core visibility into multiple customers' experiences on roaming partners' RANs can help crowdsource information about issues that can be brought to light even before the M&O partners detect them. When our customers experience significant deviations from the norm, they ask us a number of common questions about where the deviations could be coming from, ranging from the geography, uh, the device type, the percent of their devices, is it an analog radio performance issue versus digital packet logic somewhere along the chain, um, which MNOs are involved, uh, what's, what is the network element root cause, uh, what, what traffic direction was involved, so you can kind of try to find out you know, where, the, where, the bad, where the bad stuff's happening, cloud endpoints, third-party app involvement, uh, which can happen uh, in the device environment where you've got open networks for other people to use, and so on. Their key concerns are about service recovery, cost, cost containment, and better control moving forward. So the visibility of a purpose-built IoT core, uh, the visibility that a purpose-built IoT core can provide 
as we've shown you, sounds like a really good tool to answer these questions and address these concerns, right? Uh, but you have to understand there's a wrinkle. There's a significant variation in the extent to which the core information that I've talked about is put to use for IoT connectivity customers, depending on the type of organization providing the service and their principal business objectives. Now, I need to say up front, especially if any of them are listening at the moment, that we have great relationships with and tremendous amount of respect for our mobile network operator partners. So we don't mean this to look or sound like a knock on them, but the reality nonetheless is that it's really important for uh, IoT solution providers to understand uh, is that the reality is mobile network operators are primarily focused on and set up to support relatively simple, homogeneous consumer mobile subscriptions in mass quantities. They're really not set up to deal with the complexities of individual custom built IoT applications. Further, since they've largely outsourced the operations of their networks to third parties, who in turn leave the core software in the hands of large system vendors, there are inherent complications and limitations on MNO's ability to even open a view into a single IoT solution across the network, let alone help when it goes astray. This is particularly true of the cloud and device ends of the solution, which as we've seen, are at the root of the majority of large scale issues. Looking at another connectivity provider category, classic MVNOs, it's clear that they are working from a vantage point that is one step even further removed from the action, which only, with only a narrow window into the MNO networks, and so they're even more hamstrung in practice. The ERIS approach, in contrast, is founded on a mobile core and deeply experienced global team. We've built both the core and the team exclusively for IoT with super transparent access for our customers to its information. It'll be helpful to illustrate what this approach can support with a couple of specific examples. You'll recall the customer I mentioned earlier with the half million runaway devices that were causing millions of dollars in overages. Turns out they created the problem themselves with an OTA update to their radio modules that included a bug that caused them to seek information from a third party site that was non-responsive and then repeat the attempt over and over and over again, like that bad propane tank I talked about. We found this root cause for them quickly through forensics on their traffic destinations made possible by our core visibility and help them avoid many, literally millions of dollars in overages that would not have been possible without us on the scene. They would have looked for a very long time to figure out that bug, given the obscurity of it. Another long-term customer with nearly 2 million tracking devices in the field is having connectivity performance issues with a new product supported by their direct MNO partner. You know, companies with millions of devices you know, uh, you know, tend not to necessarily put all their eggs in one basket. Um, but in this case, the, the MNO them troubleshoot the problem. Uh, because it was out on the RAN and it was kind of obscure. We identified the issue fairly quickly, looking at tower interaction information. Uh, and as a matter of, it was a matter of a received sensitivity threshold set too low on their module. Not a very difficult problem to solve. You just had to find out that that's what, they, that's what the issue was, given where they were trying to get coverage. Our recommended higher setting fixed the problem and they were on their way. A third example is an off-grid solar provider in Africa whose devices were having difficulty connecting based on a simple MVNO model of least cost roaming, which I'll explain in another slide in a little bit more detail. But this tied them to inferior and often failing connections. Our coverage optimized MNO roaming approach, um, which I'll get to, uh, solved the problem. And in addition, uh, we separately along the way found a bunch of their devices with bad antennas. So now, now they're off and running and uh, one of our happiest customers in, in Africa. Now that we've hit the highlights of detection and remediation, uh, just a couple of examples, let's talk about prevention. We'll review here the lessons we've learned in coverage optimization, app design, device configuration, lifecycle management, security, cloud hardening, and a little bit on prediction, uh, which is in kind of the earlier stages of development. Note that a number of these topics are worthy of potentially whole webinars all by themselves. For today, we're just gonna hit the highlights with a special focus on the things that are absolutely the most critical to helping address the stuff that goes most horribly wrong informed by our experience. Our first preventative measure is ensuring optimal coverage. To understand why this is a concern, 
you first need to know how mobile devices are controlled by default. Uh, and again, this is one of those things that our smartphones all do. We, we have no idea what goes on, you know, underneath the glass screen. Um, but there's a there's a thing called the prior the roaming priority list in your SIM. So with a standard SIM from MNO, that priority list is set up with um, with rules that are configured to favor the MNO's own towers, regardless of whether or not they have the best signal strength in a given situation because that minimizes the MNO's costs by avoiding charges they would otherwise have to pay to their rowing partners. Makes perfect sense for them to do this. And under most circumstances, the uh, you know, consumer smartphone users, they don't pay any attention to this. Uh, they just move closer to the window if they need to. But for IoT devices, this is trickier. So with an Aeros SIM, given the structure that we've set up with our carriers, uh, the structure of our relationship, Tower selection can be based instead on maximizing connection quality, which increases the odds that your poor IoT device out there with no one around to help it um, is going to get better coverage. And that's exactly what was happening with the solar provider in Africa. And what's, it's what happening, it, what's happening with our, um, our uh, uh, propane tank customer and so forth. Uh, it's true even, by the way, in mobile applications where you think this would be kind of a less of a big deal. But as any of you who've traveled around the United States much know, it's a big country with a lot of wide open spaces. So what we found through a lot of drive testing is that this preference for the best tower as opposed to the least cost tower uh, will give you up to 20% improvement uh, over any single MNO's network. Our customers in Africa have seen even larger gains because of the sort of dynamic nature of, of coverage and, and mobile operators in that, in that region. Next is application design. We found that with connected vehicle programs in particular, where there's a consumer facing application involved, it's key to build network awareness into app functionality and into state, instruments, state instrumentation and logging from the app that can help first line customer support resources identify root causes of problems when people call in. For example, uh, remote vehicle operations like open trunk to receive a package or start engine in order to run the heat or air conditioning to precondition your cabin, as it's called, uh, involve a connection from the driver's smartphone to the cloud and then back to the car. If the phone is connected, but the car isn't, maybe because it's in an underground parking garage, remote operations will fail, generating support calls that can be easily, cannot be easily resolved when the car re-enters coverage and everything's working normally. To prevent this, it's best to check the car or device's status regularly and address the implications of that in the mobile app. These status check and logging ideas also apply to other devices in the scene like sensors or cameras that can have similar performance issues. As we've noted uh, on the, the uh, Unpack the Device page, uh, the combination of SIM, radio module, and device behavior is a common cause of issues. Our best practices list here, some of which is admittedly a bit technical, so forgive me for a minute, uh, includes, number one, randomizing the timing of reporting connections across pools of devices. And if you have everybody trying to talk at once uh, across your entire network, you can take down towers and potentially your cloud. Uh, so randomizing that timing helps distribute the load. Number two, creating RAN connections only when needed and tearing them down when complete avoids dangling and unused resources in the network. Number three, you want to register only for the resource types you need, uh, either circuit or packet switch, but not both, if you don't really need both of those, just to limit the amount of uh, cost and complexity that you're imposing on the network, and that'll work well for you. Number four, uh, you want to implement a watchdog timer that launch, uh, at the edge device that launches a secure edge system reboot of the whole thing in case of persistent connectivity failure. This is the equivalent of rebooting your laptop when Windows goes unrecoverably astray. But remember, in this case, we don't have anyone around to reboot it. So that needs to happen automatically in case something goes wrong. And there, therefore, you can reduce the odds of, of you know, bricked and lost devices in the field, which are expensive to, to go get and, and, and uh, recover. So number five, uh, you want to make sure you're supporting, um, I think we advanced the slide, one too fast. Here we go. Uh, number five, you want to make sure that you're supporting this, the roaming list updates for the uh, preference that I talked about and treating them as read only so you can take advantage of, of coverage optimized roaming consistently. So now we get to uh, lifecycle management. Now, this is 
one of those subjects that could have its own webinar. But for today, I just want to talk about the most important thing by far, and that is making sure that when you do an over-the-air update to any or all of those several software layers in your connected thing, you have to make sure that those are absolutely flawless. Since the downsides of the failed or buggy software update can be huge, as I talked about with our, our half a million devices customer. This may seem like stating the obvious, but experience suggests it's not really that obvious for everyone. So let's be super clear. It's essential to define a small pilot or test sub subset of your devices where you can prove that it's absolutely flawless without messing up everybody. Number two, make sure it works perfectly end to end, not just at the device, but across uh, across the entire chain back to your cloud and across a range of representative conditions out in the real world. After careful evaluation, update the rest of your devices, but not all at once, do it in batches through controlled validated stages. On security, fortunately, we haven't seen any malicious attacks succeed in our customer base's IoT solutions over the years. Um, we follow a number of multi-layer security best practices uh, with our customers uh, around the network and their solutions. They're essentially industry convention now, uh, kind of the early days of a lot of hacking in IoT uh, with you know, default passwords and so forth are, are thankfully uh, behind us. Um, these have kept the devices and their connections pretty well protected. Where we're moving now from a security perspective is, is kind of the safety of the, of the system overall. Uh, and, it's, and it's about um, uh, throttling and data caps to prevent what amount to self-denial of service attacks when devices go awry because of uh, configuration issues or software bugs. I'll talk about this a little bit more in the cloud hardening uh, case. And separately, uh, making sure that you're monitoring very closely uh, edge networks like Wi-Fi uh, that are exposed to, you know, potentially unsanctioned usage, which can drive up your costs for no good reason. You know, think of a nurse using a um, connected healthcare device uh, to surf Netflix on her coffee break, right? We've seen that happen. <laughs> so hardening cloud operations, um, the last uh, last topic on the, uh, uh, the kind of the concrete uh, prevention side here is also worth a, probably a couple of separate webinars. But today, I just want to hit uh, three high points. Uh, number one, when you launch a connected thing with a highly data-driven cloud-based application, you need to realize that you're now in a different class of software business than you may have been in the past, which means you can't stop your app work after you launch it. You have to engage in, this, in a continuous cycle that all of the social media operators really understand of performance management, supporting progressively higher scale greater functionality while maintaining responsiveness and cost control, goals that inherently work at cross purposes. So, so it's an interesting challenge. There's a lot of you know, lessons learned in the, uh, in the cloud application business about that. Uh, but it's just something that it, it takes a consciousness that that's something that you need to watch and, and be proactive about. Number two, you need to protect your cloud through throttling, I've already mentioned, throughout the solution at the load balancer, your API gateway, and internal routers. Uh, as well as keeping timeouts uh, in your code on the cloud side in sync with timeouts on your devices so you don't end up with dangling resources on either side waiting, you know, installed conditions. And number three, you need to instrument everything at individual transaction levels to enable sufficiently granular troubleshooting and test and test and test and test with rigor uh, with a total perfectionist discipline, especially any configuration changes that could yield outages. Uh, and we've seen people take down parts of their solution, uh, a whole connected vehicle solution had like 80% of its functionality gone uh, because of a simple misconfiguration in, a, in a, uh, an infrastructure change on the cloud side. Um, and test at production scale before you implement anything in your live cloud, uh, which you know, often people don't think about uh, fully. So our last topic, issue prediction, uh, is a very brief preview of coming events at Aris. The network management world has been leveraging AIML techniques for smart monitoring and adaptive alarming for a few years now. Uh, and we've been doing the same thing in monitoring our own network, our own core. Uh, so we make sure that, uh, as I mentioned, um, the variety of things that can happen with our customers is now running our, our capacity plan. Uh, the, data set, the data set I'm showing here uh, starts with a month-long sample of that same weekly kind of business pattern uh, from the customer example I showed you earlier. Uh, and here, a, a machine learning algorithm is applied uh, to create a confidence interval around what we should be seeing in the next 24 hours based on the last month's worth of activity. 
What this allows is, is adaptive alarming on deviation, uh, a number of which are clearly shown here, uh, that's much more effective than conventional fixed thresholds. Uh, so it's, it's a tighter window around what should be happening. And that allows you, you know, it's hard to predict the future exactly, uh, but that tighter window uh, gives you the opportunity to catch things when they start going astray. Remember 1030 in the morning on that bad Tuesday? Um, we caught we caught that fairly fast. It was a little, and that and that launched the um, investigation into root cause um, more rapidly than would have been the case if we actually watched that happen for a couple of days. So we're working now actually to uh, apply these tools in more detail and to make them available for the customer, our customers to use themselves. Um, and uh, basically, stay tuned for more news on that front. So uh, to wrap things up, uh, I just wanted to say as we've seen. Uh, IoT solutions can go astray in a wide variety of ways. But if you choose your connectivity provider correctly, hint, hint, uh, you'll have plenty of tools and support at your disposal to help you avoid them and to recover quickly if and when the time comes. So, Jeremy, I think it's time for some uh, Q&A. I think it is. Thank, thanks very much, Steve. And um, uh, first of all, I want to thank ladies and gentlemen for sending in questions, which you have been doing in numbers. Please keep them coming. There's more to be said all the time. Uh, so the first question is uh, the following. You noted that devices are often a source of problems. The questioner wants to know, how do you see the module and device ecosystem evolving to address that theme? So um, this is something that we're actually working on right now with um, with our partners in that scene. And what we're finding is, is um, you know, as, as I mentioned, IoT has been around for a while and it, it's definitely uh, growing up. I'd say, you know, it's maybe a teenager at this point, but uh, where, where it's going to school right now is exactly this area where there's um, a lot of collaboration happening uh, between uh, the radio module, uh, uh, the chip manufacturers, the radio module manufacturers and the device manufacturers uh, to, address the fact that, uh, and those of you who are in that uh, roughly one third experienced with this bucket, uh, or actually the two thirds of you that are, you know, we've, you're in the program already, know that one of the things that people end up doing is, is messing around for a long time just to get everything to work together properly, all those layers of configuration in that set. Uh, so uh, the evolution that we're seeing is, is a lot of collaboration uh, between uh, IoT service providers like ourselves and those layers in the food chain to try to um, build, you know, one plus one is more than two kind of partnerships uh, that solve those kinds of issues and enable new uh, new features. So there's a lot of that uh, space that's really not been explored well. Fair enough. Um, this is a question that I, I kind of wanted to ask myself, so I'm glad somebody has. The attendee says, what's the most unusual or surprising thing you've seen go wrong with a company's IoT solution? I'm all ears. So this was a fun one. Um, we have a company in, a customer in Australia uh, that does uh, uh, vehicle tracking. And they found, uh, actually we found, sorry, uh, that they, for some reason, were branching out into Thailand. And we weren't sure that that was part of their business. So we checked in with them and they, we said, uh, you got anything working in Thailand? And they said, no. Uh, so we, we dug in and what we found is that somehow uh, someone had gotten their hands on a package of their SIMs and uh, taken them off to Thailand. And the thieves were actually running what they intended to be a free SMS service for themselves and their buddies. And uh, the, the irony of all that is that our SIMs are locked down so that they cannot actually dial a, they cannot send SMS to or have any interaction with a dialable number. Because there's no reason you need an IoT device to phone somebody. They can phone a system, but not somebody, right? <laughs> uh, so that uh, the, the thieves were actually causing our customer in Australia costs because every time they tried to use it, it was burning capacity in the network which we have to pay for so then therefore some our customer has to pay us for right uh, but nothing of any use was happening out of it so we got that shut down pretty quickly but you found it fast good um questioner here would like to know what effects on solution performance do you see in the migration to lte and lte m 
Um, so LTE is um, relatively, uh, I think, relatively benign from the perspective of the, the issue we're seeing in LTEM. Uh, and that is that, um, it, you know, anytime you make a move from one uh, radio access technology to another, there's always a bit of growing pains associated with understanding how it's best configured to work for IoT devices. And LTEM is specifically designed for IoT devices, but what we're finding is our mobile, not mobile operator partners uh, in their implementation of it, again, because for the most part, their business is about serving smartphones, um, there are some elements of the standard that they haven't fully implemented or they haven't configured correctly uh, to enable things like network timers uh, and uh, network timer alignment uh, with what needs to be happening on the device in order to maximize battery life. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, all that will get sorted out, but in the interim, uh, some of the expectations that people have on LTEM are going to be uh, uh, a little more challenging to meet uh, over the course of the next year or two, I think. Uh, a not unrelated question here. Johan wants to know, what is your future view on LP-WAN connectivity? He says, as a commodity. And what LP WAN solutions do you think will be around in the next five years? Hmm. Well, it's interesting. Uh, we often, uh, even for uh, you know, current and and uh, and now sunset um, forms of IoT connectivity, um, run into customers with the the concept that these things are you know it's it's absolutely a commodity and and. Um, anybody's connectivity is, is the same as everybody else's. So, you know, it's all about low, low cost. Um, and so th that work always kind of um, gives us a, a bit of trouble because uh, as I've shown you, there's a lot of variation in the ability for a connectivity provider uh, to help you when things go wrong, as I said. Um, and whether it's LP WAN or something else, you're going to have that, all, all of the things that I've discussed are the, uh, are essentially the, uh, you know, they all apply. Um, what we will see because of lower cost, uh, ultimately, it, you know, not necessarily that it is a, you know, a uniform commodity as, as an issue or, or a perspective on it. It's, it's more that uh, it does have structurally lower costs associated with it, uh, the LP WAN solution. So you will find uh, a lot more business use cases uh, for IoT connectivity uh, that start making sense. And so, so everyone's forecast of very, very large growth in the number of devices uh, we see is making a lot of sense. Um, and so what, what will we see in five years? Uh, well, right now it's a little tough to even see past the next 18 months, but uh, you'll see a lot more things being tracked uh, and probably a lot more of those scale issues that we've been talking about. Uh, there's a question here from Balaji who asked, which is best, LTM or NB-IoT? And I suspect that may depend on the application, but um, uh, again. You're absolutely right. And so it's kind of like asking, so which is best, a screwdriver or a hammer? You know, it depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, L, so, so the way to understand the LTM and NB-IoT is, is really about um, uh, scale and cost and the amount of data that you can successfully transmit from a device. So. Uh, and, and if you put LTE at the beginning of that list of three, then you have really the full set. So if you have a fair amount of data to send, if you're doing something with video, for example, clearly LTE is the hammer for that nail. Uh, if you're sensing just a, a meter, uh, uh, the, the value of a meter on, on water flow once in a while, or a tank level once in a while, uh, then NBIOT way down at that end, uh, is potentially the right answer if you're going to track postal packages or something. You just need to know where a postal package is once in a while. If it's got to be very, very low cost, battery operated, and send almost no data, NB-IoT is great. LTEM is actually in the middle of those two. Uh, it's capable of a bit more data rate than NB-IoT in a practical sense. Um, and uh, so, again, it depends on what your application is. Um, Balaji has asked another one, and I'm thankful for that. Thank you, Balaji. Is Eris or does Eris have an NB IoT or LTM services in India? Well, you know, unfortunately, um, the Indian government has, uh, for a long time now, uh, 
forbidden MVNOs from operating in India. And because we're classified in that category, we don't actually provide connectivity in India. We'd love to. So if you write to uh, Mr. Modi, <laughs> okay. I want to have a chat about that. Um, questioner here would like to know, you mentioned that some of your prevention topics, Stephen, could have separate webinars to cover them in more detail. When do you expect you'll be holding those? Uh, so we're putting our um, our campaign uh, plan together for the next quarter or so, uh, and I suspect that you'll be seeing some of those things come up within two to three months, uh, but we don't have dates uh, set up just yet. But uh, if you'll allow us to communicate with you through your email uh, and don't uh, don't unsubscribe from us, uh, we'll be happy to um, happy to uh, send you some uh, information about that when we've got that together. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. Um, Miroslav would like to ask, is predictive analytics maintenance uh, applicable for the IAT uh, uh, amongst the killers, well presented amongst the killers? Mm, trying to make sure I understand the question. Uh, can, it, I think what you mean is, can we, can we apply predictive analytics to eliminate yep. Um, those those issues. That's what I took. Um, yeah. yeah. So the way that works in practice uh, has a lot to do with the repeatability of the phenomenon you're watching. Uh, so if there are if there are regular patterns in things, uh, then predictive analytics, uh, as I showed you that simple example, uh, will be reasonably reliable a reasonably reliable way of identifying when something is going out of spec. Uh, more quickly than if you simply had a, you know, a broad threshold. Um, if you get things that are, um, if the nature of your application does not have a relatively repeatable pattern in it, then obviously that's going to be more challenging. So that's really the filter between um, things that you could catch uh, in that way and things that you, in, in situations in which that might be more challenging. Yeah. Uh, Nay Palma has put a, a question to us wanting to know how, you adapt solutions in countries that do not have 5G or NB-IoT or LT and related technologies available just yet, uh, because it says many of the prototype pro products still already have those technologies. So how do you adapt? Well, fortunately, the way um, uh, the way the 5G uh, standards community has, has tackled IoT. Um, it gives us kind of a cheat, and that is that LTEM is part of the 5G standard. Um, and a lot of the things that uh, 5G, and this, this is also a whole separate conversation, uh, the, the gap between the aspirations of 5G and the reality of implementation, uh, both in terms of how much is it actually rolled out and to what extent is it doing something that's fundamentally different uh, than LTE, uh, as opposed to 10 or 15 percent better uh, along a couple of dimensions. Um, all of that is, is a kind of a long story. But the good news for most IoT applications is that LTE and LTEM uh, in particular will be kind of grandfathered into the 5G scene. So there, there's really not a great need to uh, wait around for 5G to happen. You can simply do, do what you need to do on LTEM. Yeah. And NBI IoT for that matter. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. There's a forward-looking yep. um, question here from Diraj, who says, when it comes to securing the network from unauthorized devices or external de distributed denial of service or attacks of a similar nature, what do you see, Stephen, as the role of machine learning to continually enhance the policy and security rules on an ongoing basis? Great question. Yeah, I think... Um uh, machine learning for enhancing policy is uh, a bit aspirational. Our approach to uh, security that's been that's really quite effective uh, is making sure that you got everything when you when you're at the very start, making sure you've got everything locked down as much as you possibly can. Uh, so we have a, a, a service called Connection Lock uh, that means that your IoT device can only reach one endpoint in the network, and that's it. Period. Uh, and you can change that, but only you can change that. Uh, so when you think about security with that, you know, multi-layer, very rigid, we're going to lock down everything we can. And, it, and it's fortunate that 
um, that works in an IoT environment because unlike a smartphone that needs to call generically anywhere uh, and anyone in order for it to serve its purpose, uh, for an IoT device, its purpose is very, very narrow in relative terms. So you can keep it that way. Uh, I think where machine learning would come in is, as I said, the detection of anomalies uh, and leaks in that environment. And, and one of the security issues we have is, as I said, um, unauthorized use of that cellular connecti connectivity back to the cloud uh, and then kind of branching into other clouds and so forth. But that's, that's I think, the best application of machine learning there. Thank you. Um, we're doing well for time, but uh, and questions are still coming in which I'm grateful. Mm -hmm. I think we probably got time for a few more. Zaim uh, asks, will your IoT platform work in the GCC region in the Middle East? Absolutely, and we have customers there uh, now. Oh, give us a call. <laughs> That's it, yeah, absolutely, give you a call. Um, Vishal wants to ask, uh, quite a long question, but it's interesting to know mm -hmm. what Eris' uh, learnings are in this area. New devices, he says, uh, testing and validation before their launch in the network is a major criteria for use case deployment. Mm -hmm. uh, granted, eSIM lifecycle management platform with mobile devices and management policy is also required. What is Eris's learning in this domain? Well, so I, I think there's kind of two different stories there, actually. One is simply um, uh, device testing and validation. We have um, we, we do have a solutions business running in India, uh, by the way, uh, with uh, vehicle tracking and uh, fleet management capabilities and so forth uh, that uh, are in use for uh, e-rickshaws and a number of other uh, scooters and a number of other things in, in country. Uh, so we have we actually have a ton of experience uh, working through that early life cycle stage with our OEM customers there uh, around device selection and testing and validation. And... Um, it's much like any um, cellular device certification process. Um, you need to uh, make sure that it's doing that it's following the standards in order in order to communicate correctly with the network. And uh, what we have found to be a little bit unique is the development of uh, essentially calibration of an any analog kinds of activity related to the device. Uh, not so much the cellular connectivity part, because that pretty much works, uh, but if you've got a temperature sensor, for example, or you're trying to gauge the level of fuel in a tank, uh, there is a lot of, um, I, I was in the robotics industry a long time ago, and we had this phrase, mud wrestling with mother nature. So you've got a lot of variation around the norm of the kind of activity you're trying to track automatically. Um, then you have to do a lot of extra testing across a bunch of different circumstances in order to calibrate that effectively uh, to, for it to be useful. Now, as far as eSIM is concerned, um, what's happening in the industry today is a lot of advertisement uh, around that. Uh, and right now, a lot of challenges on the supply side underneath the covers of actually fulfilling that concept. Uh, so it's important to be really super careful to inspect well uh, anything that you're doing with anyone in the eSIM environment right now. It's a very, very fluid and dynamic situation. Um, as I said, there are lots of partnerships um, emerging at that lower device and radio module level uh, around a number of things, one of which is eSIM. But uh, you, you just want to be kind of, you want to pilot, pilot your course carefully in that, in that environment right now. Fair enough. Uh, we've got uh, time for a few more questions. There's a terminology <laughs> one and then a, one on maximizing battery life that I'd like to bring to you, Stephen. The question mm -hmm. uh, from Balaji is uh, on terminology. What do you mean by MVNO and he says AVNO? I, I, I think he may have uh, been referring to uh, MNO, but come back to that. Yeah, so, so MVNO is Mobile Virtual Network Operator. Uh, and it's essentially, it started out as people just reselling SIMs uh, to, uh, for, you know, mobile network operators use the MVNOs uh, as essentially a distribution channel uh, for reach to consumers in a particular branded environment. Uh, so I think Disney was an MVNO at one point in time. Uh, in IoT, it's essentially uh, handling, uh, as I said, the, the, the MNOs, are really keen on selling uh, mobile subscriptions to smartphone users. Uh, and they can do that in mass quantities through their own distribution channels. IoT ends up being kind of like a, 
fair uh, redheaded stepchild in the family, and they need someone to take care of that. So that's where the MDNOs came in. Uh, but for the most part, they do not have uh, what we do in terms of the core that lets us actually roam on those mobile networks, uh, as opposed to just reselling SIMs. And I'm not sure what an AVNO is. Uh, you might have been referring to an ARIS virtual network operator because that we are kind of in our own category. So um, I hope that helps. Uh, that helps. Thank you. Um, question here. It's a long one. So I think we'll just cut to the uh, end, if we may. Um, mm -hmm. we, the questioner is talking about uh, protecting battery life. So if we look at the last part of it, mm -hmm. just so that we can get as many questions addressed as possible. For low power, read battery power devices, what approach do you recommend to maximize the life of the battery? So the first thing is use LTEM. Uh, because it actually was designed to address specifically this problem so that you can maintain a connection for days at a time that requires essentially no power. It's just the network stays open watching for you, and when you want to use it, you can get on the network without having to go through all of the session establishment uh, work over again. Uh, that's the part where I said the implementation of LTEM is running a little bit behind the, 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 the reality is a little behind the promise of that. Uh, because the networks have to be truly configured in order to make, it, make that uh, something you can take advantage of. Uh, if you're not using LTEM yet, uh, then there are some tricks that, uh, that we know uh, to help make uh, what you're doing more battery efficient uh, in a battery powered device. Um, and there's simple things like, you know, do it less often, first of all, uh, or as seldom as you can. Uh, and then make sure one of the things that we worked with one of our customers around uh, was the issue of of how you're organizing the transmission. And in their case, they had a fairly significant uh, sort of prelude to the data that they had to send as sort of a preamble. Um, and then they sent the data. And if the connection failed partway along, then they started the whole thing over again, as opposed to picking up where they left off. Uh, so that latter thing, being able to, in your transmit uh, of reporting, uh, pick up where you left off if there's a failure or a glitch somewhere along the way, uh, is an important thing. Stephen, you've been very generous with your time and your expertise, and uh, I'm very grateful, and I'm sure our audience is as well. Um, thank you, everyone who has taken part today. Our aim has been to try and show you, with the expertise of Eris on hand, quickly how you fix the 10 things that could kill your IoT application. I'm afraid that is all we have time for. I do hope you'll bookmark our website at iot-now.com. That's where you'll find the latest news, videos, blogs, events, reviews, interviews, and from tomorrow, you can stream this webinar from the site. It just remains for me to say a huge thank you to our speaker, Stephen Glapper from Aris. Thanks, and Stephen. Thanks to you all as well. It's been great. Most of all, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us right around the world and at this time, more than ever, please keep safe, and we really appreciate the time you've spent with us. From everyone here at IoT Now and Eris, bye for now.